Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel and welcome to Fable Fridays, the day of the week where I sit down and tell you guys an old story, but don't get it twisted. These are not your mama's fairy tales. A lot of these are darker and they may contain adult content. Also, I may modernize some parts or rewrite little sections that aren't going to upset the integrity of the story, but just make it a little bit more relatable maybe to today's audience because a lot of these stories were written in the 1600s, the 1800s, and the language alone is like so confusing to read through these stories. Last week, I posted the very first one and I called it skincare in a story and a lot of people Said that that was a very confusing series name so here we are fable fridays i still am going to be doing skincare in today's video the whole idea was like sleepover nostalgia of doing like face mask and stuff i'll be continuing that in this video but that way i'm not totally locked in i was gonna start calling this facials and fables because how freaking cute is that but what if there's a day that i don't want to do a facial like what if i want to drink a glass of wine or paint my nails or just sit there and tell you guys the story you know last time i told the story of Bluebeard, a wife serial killer it was a good time so if you guys missed it you should definitely check that one out but today Today's story is a much more obscure story. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that most of you guys have not heard this story. Today's story is a German story published in the 1800s by the Brothers Grimm. And unlike a lot of other stories by the Brothers Grimm, this one does not have really strong ties to an earlier story. A lot of their stories are ones that they either rewrote to fit with their times or maybe they were the first to publish it, but it was a well-known story that was told orally before they published it. But this one, I couldn't find any solid proof that it was around before the Brothers Grimm published it and it is called The Three Snake Leaves. Before I get started, please subscribe to my channel, hit that bell notification so that you know when I post videos because not every video gets pushed out into the algorithm. And also leave me a comment either requesting certain stories or just telling me anything you wanna tell me in the comments below. I read them all, I love them. All right, for my mask today, I'm going to be using the Summer Fridays R&R mask. This has a lot of rose in it and it also has delicately ground wild rose powder that helps exfoliate dead skin cells so I felt like my skin was looking a little dull today so instead of like a hydrating mask or a deep cleansing pore mask mud mask I wanted to do something with a little bit more exfoliation in it so that is what we have going on today you might not be able to see it as well because it's a clear mask with little beads in it but I'm still going to be wearing it and exfoliating my skin as I tell this story. This is gonna feel good. Once upon a time in a land far away, there was a very kind but poor old man who was having more and more trouble providing for his only son. His son was a teenager, he required a lot of food, and the man was finding it really hard to feed his son. He was going without meals himself in order to sustain his growing boy and he just couldn't do it anymore. He was getting too old. And the son recognized this. And also he was getting to that age where he was ready to go out into the world and spread his wings. You know, I'm imagining that he's like 18 years old, maybe a little younger, because this is back in the 1800s. Maybe he's 16, but he's like, you know, I'm ready to make something of myself, provide for myself, maybe even provide for my father. So he goes to his dad and he explains his wish to leave the nest and go do something in the world. And his father was extremely sad, but understood, knew this day was coming and gave the son his blessing. So this boy, he goes out into the world and he finds out that the king of his country is in the middle of this giant war with a neighboring land. And he's not doing so well, like he's losing the war. It's, it's not great. And the boy is like, this is a great opportunity. I'll be a soldier. So he joins the cause and they assign him to a certain group and he's out in a battle one day with his group and they are losing this battle. They are literally about to lose this entire war. This battle is going so poorly and he was terrified. He was thrust into this brand new role. He didn't have any training. He was literally this poor farmer's son and it was extremely scary, but he was determined to be brave. This boy had a big heart and he knew right from wrong and he wanted to do his very best. So as this battle is going on, people around him are dropping like flies. People are dying. The leader of his group gets killed right in front of him, not the king, but like the leader of his little group that he was assigned to. And as he's watching this happen, a lot of his fellow soldiers turn coat and run. Like they're like, we're out of here. We're losing. We're about to die. We're out of here. We're going back to our families. He knows that they are about to lose and it's going to be terrible. He decides to stand up on a stump 
and yell at all of the people to come hither and he gave the biggest pep rally speech of all time about being brave about honor and duty and just being the best bravest soldiers you can be he's a powerful speaker and he is giving so much courage and confidence to this group of soldiers that they not only rally and go back into the battle but they win the battle and the entire war like they kick butt he gives this little pep rally speech and like the war is won like it's a big deal right like he has turned the tides of this entire kingdom's fate so the king when he finds out that he owes his entire war basically like his whole kingdom to this one boy he does not hesitate to give this boy anything he wants he gives him a ton of riches land palaces makes him the first in the kingdom i don't know what that means maybe it's like the head war guy or like the head noble under like the king's people, I don't know, but he's the first in the land. It's like a big deal. Pretty much anything this boy wants, the king is going to happily give him, but the boy doesn't want much. You know, yes, the riches are great. Yes, the title is great, but he was just a humble, poor farmer's son and he didn't really know what to ask for, except one thing he did want. And that was the king's daughter's hand in marriage, which, to be honest, is like kind of the biggest thing he could have asked for because that's basically like if the king says yes, he's basically going to inherit the entire kingdom. So, I mean, like he couldn't have asked for anything bigger than that really, but the king doesn't see it this way. The king is more than happy to like spoil this boy rotten. And he's basically like, okay, like I'm not saying no, but you just need to know like my daughter, she's weird. I literally loved this part. <laughs> like it's just so unexpected that the king is like, yeah, my daughter, she's beautiful. Like I get it. I know why you're asking, but like, she is weird. Like, can't you just take a manor over there and just like be on your way? And the story is about to get really interesting, but it's time for me to wash off my mask. So I'll be right back. All right, next I'm gonna use the Peter Thomas Roth Cucumber Detox Hydrogel Eye Patches under my eyes to give it a little bit of TLC. So the king's daughter, the weirdie, right? I just love that description. It's so dumb. Like, it's just so dumb to think of the king being like, yeah, you can marry her, but like, she's weird. Don't you want like anything else in life? Maybe more than like marrying my weird child, you know? This is so weird to like tell a story with eye patches on. Like, who am I? What is this idea? But I'm kind of into it. This princess, she's incredibly beautiful, but the reason that everyone says she's weird and strange is because she has made a vow to take no one as a husband who will not promise her to be buried alive with her if she dies first. Foreshadowing, am I right? The logic she uses to explain this is that she feels that anyone who loves her enough to want to marry her should love her so much that if she died, they would have no reason to go on living, which is very Edward Cullen and New Moon in my opinion. But she basically says, I feel the same way. I am happy to be buried alive with them. If they die first, they have to agree to also do that or else I don't want no husband. And this guy, he's like, yeah, that's fine. That's normal. I'll do it. Like what a normal request, you know, like, yeah, I'll be buried alive with you if you die first. And these are essentially kids. Like they're 16 years old. They're not even legal adults yet. Like in modern society. I mean, they don't say how old they are. I'm just making it up based on like the ages that people got married back then. But this is just like a very severe kind of promise to expect of someone. And I'm kind of thinking that the boy didn't really think it through, you know? Like boys are kind of dumb at that age. He probably just thought like, well, we're not gonna die till we're 90, you know? When in reality, like any story that has that as part of the storyline, it's probably going to happen in the story at some point. It says in the story that up until this point, this promise had scared away any of the other quote, wooers but the boy was like yeah i'll do it you're so beautiful i love you and it's funny because i'm not sure that they've actually met before this conversation like it's not in the story like i think this is their first meeting but he's in love and he wants to marry her and he wants to kiss her anytime he wants and so they get married the king is like okay like i tried to warn you i tried to give you a yacht instead but if you want to marry my weird daughter go at it and they had a beautiful wedding and 
they had a really happy life. Well, for a couple of years at least. I'm gonna take these off now. It's really, really weird to talk and tell stories with these eye patches on. Like, I might need to not make that a regular thing in this series because it just makes it hard, you know? Like, they like fall off and they look weird. Like, in my viewfinder, I'm like, ooh, I don't like it. So, for my cream, I'm going to use the same one I used last time, which is my Notorium Intense Overnight Sleeping Cream. Love this stuff feels really nice especially after a mask oh it's my favorite so putting this on and then I mean this story's like barely gotten started and I'm like done with my skincare section so um either I need to do more items of skincare or I need to just drop the skincare I mean I like the facials and fables idea but like is it necessary I don't know I guess not at this point in the story, the titles change and the princess is referred to as the queen and the boy is called the king, but it's confusing because the princess's father king is also still alive and also called king. So I have no idea like if he gave them an like part of another country that he had conquered and they were like still in line to his throne too, or if this is like a lost in translation type situation. But anyway, you have the queen and the king, and then you have the other king too. So from here on out, I'm going to refer to the boy and the princess as king and queen. But if I'm referring to the older king, the father, I'll call him old king. Okay, because that's how it is in the story. It's really confusing. A couple of years go by and the king and the queen are really happy. They have a good marriage. They have a lot of fun together. They're in love and happy and live in their lives until one day, and you knew this was coming, the queen gets ill and dies suddenly. Like she just kicks the bucket one day. Like one day she's fine dancing, jousting, doing whatever they did back then. And the next day she's like, I think the king, the boy king had kind of forgotten about the promise because in the story, like the queen is lying there dead and he doesn't like immediately try to run away. Like it takes him a minute to be like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, hell no, you know? By the time he gets his wits about him and tries to run, he realizes that the old king has posted guards at all of the exits to the castle to trap him. And you know what? Okay, like, I really like this old king. I think he's a nice guy. He treated him well when he won the battle. But I also, I see where he's coming from, like wanting to uphold this one thing for his daughter because he made it really clear, like, you shouldn't marry her because this promise is outrageous and the boy did it anyway. And part of me is like, the king shouldn't have forced this promise to go through. Like she's already dead, you know, like why does he also have to die? But I understand why the king like wanted to honor that promise of his daughters, you know? So whatever, I mean, it, there wouldn't be a story without this part. So they're like, no, you're gonna get buried. This whole time I'm imagining like a modern grave, like a, you know, six feet down and six feet long situation under the ground, like in a coffin. Um, but I forgot they were royals. So no, 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 no. They actually have like a whole room slash whole basement, like a crypt, you know, to go in. So they take the dead queen, they take the living king, the king boy, and they put him in this crypt along with four candles, four loaves of bread, and four bottles of wine, which I just think is cruel and unusual punishment, to be honest. Like, I get it. It's like, do I get it? I don't know. It just extends the suffering because he just has to sit there and still have like a little bit of food and wine to get him through and a little bit of light. I mean, it's kind in a way, but then it's like, once he runs out, like he's gonna die, you know? I don't want him to die, but I also don't want him sitting there for weeks, subsiding off of bites of bread and sips of wine and watching his candles melt away and his wife decompose and, you know, like it just seems really, really cruel and unusual, but that's how it is in the story. And that is literally how it goes in the story. He sits there for weeks, wife's decomposing, he's eating one bite of bread and one sip of wine, each day to kind of get him through. And he's just like wallowing in sadness and boredom and like staring at the walls. One day he's sitting there staring at the shadows on the walls, having his bite of bread, his sip of wine. He knows death is coming for him. Like he is starving to death. And out of the shadows of the corner of one of the walls slithers a little tiny snake. And the snake comes down the wall and starts slithering over to his wife and he freaks out, not because he's afraid of snakes, but because he thinks that this little snake has come to eat his wife, 
which like is a really strange assumption, you know, whatever. I would just be happy to see something like living, you know, like maybe there's a way out. Maybe there's a hole that you can chisel away at or something. But no, that's like, it doesn't even go into that in the story. He's just like, horrified that the snake is getting anywhere near his wife and so he takes out his sword don't know why he has a sword but he takes out his sword and chops the snake up into bits i know i don't know if you can hear pinecone screaming but that means that he's hunted usually a cello bag or a hair tie he's deaf he doesn't know what he sounds like bless He's sitting there staring at the wall again, contemplating mortality when a second little snake peeks out of the hole. And I don't know why I thought this was funny. Just like the picture of this is funny to me, but it's so sad. Like, I don't know why it's funny, but the second snake peeks his little head out, sees the dead snake and like goes back and like runs away. And I just laughed at that. I don't know why. That was just like such a stupid little image. But then a few minutes later, the second snake comes back and comes back through the hole and slithers down and it has in its mouth three little leaves. And the guy's like, what the heck? To be fair, you don't often see snakes slithering around with leaves in their mouth. So like, it's just the whole thing is weird. But this snake comes back down through the hole carrying three little green leaves in its mouth and it goes down to the first snake. It starts nudging the pieces of the dead snake back in order. And then it places a leaf on each of the cuts of the snake. And literally right as the snake puts the third leaf down, the dead snake comes back to life. The dead snake gets up and starts slithering around and the two snakes look back at the king and they're all like a freaked out and they start slithering away. And they go out the hole and they live happily ever after as far as we're concerned. And the king, he's just sitting there like, what the heck just happened? But he realizes that the snakes left the little green leaves behind. And he thought, you know, this might be crazy. I might be losing my mind. Maybe it was a hallucination, but I'm just gonna try to bring my wife back to life. If it brought the dead snake back to life, why couldn't it bring my wife back to life, you know? So he picks up the leaves and he puts one on each eye and one on the wife's mouth. And right as he's placing the third leaf, the wife comes back to life. And she's understandably super confused and scared. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know why she's in a crypt. I guess she doesn't have any memories of like being dead. She just was fine one day and then now she's in a crypt and she's like, you know, scared, of course. The husband, he calms her down. He explains what happened. He gives her some wine and bread to strengthen her and just waits until she has the energy to try to escape and together they go and they bang on the vault door and they bang so loud that the guards hear and the guards go and tell the old king that there's like sounds coming from the crypt very very suspicious the old king comes down himself to the crypt to open the door to see what the ruckus is and he's overjoyed to see his daughters back to life and his son-in-law is still alive after weeks like how did that happen and the king is just so happy i mean this is just you know a joyous reunion it's a little weird that they don't act like it's a big deal that she got brought back to life through magic no one questions it it's really strange but anyway they let him out and it like parties ensue they like party their butts off for a while they're just having a good time. They're happy to be back to life. But over time, it becomes obvious that the wife might not actually be the wife, maybe. The story doesn't actually say that outright. It doesn't have this idea that maybe she isn't the wife. That was my interpretation of the story. What it does say is that the wife seems to not have any affection for her husband anymore. And because they were so happy and in love before she died and he fulfilled the promise, like he went down into the crypt with her, not that he had a choice, but she doesn't know that. The fact that she now has kind of a different personality and isn't in love with him and just seems like sneakier and less, you know, just not herself, makes me think that maybe something else came back in her body, you know? Cause you see movies and stuff like that where like someone dies and then gets brought back, but really it's like a demon or something. So it could be a situation of that. That's my interpretation. That makes more sense to me than just she died and now she doesn't love her husband. Like that doesn't make sense. Her husband was willing to die for her as far as she knows and brought her back to life. Like. There's no reason to be out of love with him. So that's why I just think this is a really suspicious part of the story, but they don't actually say that. They just say that she's fallen out of love and 
you know, it's just, that seems like really sad. The boy king decided to keep the leaves a secret and he gave them to his most faithful servant to kind of be in charge of and keep track on and told him, tell no one and keep it on your person at all times. Cause this was the servant that like went everywhere with the boy king. And so he told him basically always have these. We never know when we're going to need to use these and we need to just always have them. There's still a lot in the story that needs to be told, but I'm gonna run down and get a drink and I'll be right back. Like I said, a change had come over the queen. She had lost all love for her husband. And we don't know if that's a side effect of having been dead or if she just, maybe she was mad that he brought her back to life. Maybe that was like, wasn't part of the deal. I don't know. It kind of makes me sad for the little snakes because does that mean that the little snake that died no longer loves the other little snake? Like that's sad. A few years later, the boy king decides that it is past time for him to go and visit his old father. Remember the poor farmer from the beginning of the story? I don't know why it takes him this long. I mean, if you add up the years and the years and the years that they're like, it's been a long time. It's kind of sad. Like, how does he know his father is still alive? Why has he not brought his father to his new kingdom? You know, like his poor father who couldn't make ends meet. Oh my gosh. I like just have really thought about that. That's really sad. Okay. Like they didn't forget about him because they're going to visit him now, but the boy king is like, I'm going to go visit my father. And the old king gives him like, a big ship and the queen decides to join. So they're still together. I don't know like how they've lived these years. It just says that, you know, she's not in love with him anymore, but I guess they're still together and she decides to join him on this voyage. And no sooner has the queen come on board, like they've been on the ship for like a day and the queen decides that she's actually in love with the captain of the ship. She's no longer in love with her husband. Like she wants to be with the ship captain. Has she been having an affair with the ship captain like before this? And maybe that's why she wanted to come on the trip in the first place. That makes more sense to me. That's not said in the story. That is what I'm thinking because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Like did she fall in love with him in a day? Yano, know, I think it makes more sense that they were like having an affair. They were already in love because otherwise I don't even know why she'd want to go on this trip with him if she's not even in love with him. Like why would she want to go on a voyage to like meet his father? You know, one night the boy king falls asleep in his cabin and his treacherous queen wife decides that she's gonna kill him. Like she hatches a devious plan, gets the ship captain that she's in love with involved in it. And together they go in to the boy king's chambers, chambers, cabin, and one takes his head and one takes his feet and they carry him and throw him overboard while he is sleeping. What the heck, girl? Like he brought you back to life. He's a faithful husband. He's a good guy that saved your father's kingdom. Like what the heck, girl? Like just get your priorities in line, you know? And of course I'm like, well, he's definitely, he can't be dead, right? Like he's not dead. No, he's dead. Okay, like he is. So the queen and the captain, they hatch this plan together that they're going to turn the ship around, go back to the kingdom and tell the king that the boy king came down with a mysterious illness and died on board and they gave him a ship burial. They threw him overboard in a burial and they gave him all the rights, you know, that was due to him. I don't know. It does not make any sense to me that she thinks that she's going to get out of the deal of like being buried with him. Like, why does she get to walk away? She also promised, you know, why does she get to kill him? It doesn't make any sense. So like in her mind, how is that an excuse that the king is going to take seriously? She tells the captain that she is going to talk him up so much that her father will have no choice but to agree to let her marry the captain. So the captain's like, okay, like I'm gonna get a queen as a wife, you know? And they turn the ship around and they start heading back to the kingdom. But as this is happening, the faithful servant that had the snake leaves, he saw this all go down. He was on the ship, of course. He saw the queen and the captain murder his master. And then also he heard the plans of like how they were gonna be super devious. And this faithful servant is like, oh no, like not on my watch. He steals a lifeboat and under the shadow of darkness, sails away where they don't see him and somehow is able to fish up the young king's body and restore him with the leaves. Don't know how he found him in the ocean. Don't know how he got him back up to the boat, but he did. And he put the little snake leaves on him and the young king came back to life, which is amazing, right? 
So the servant tells the king everything that happened and like his wife's treachery and everything. And they decide to row really fast and try to beat the queen and the captain on their ship, which sounds really realistic, you know? Somehow this works and the young king and the servant are able to row and beat the ship that got like a massive head start and was a ship. So yeah, it's a story. So the servant and the young king make it to the kingdom first and they go to the old king and they tell him everything. And the old king is appalled by his daughter's behavior. I mean, he is not gonna play favorites with blood at that point. You know, he's going to take the side of who's right. He's always been like a fair, good king. And you know, he thought it was right to make the boy king get buried because that was the promise that he made. And he also knows that his daughter is in the wrong right now. You know, you can't just go around throwing your husbands overboard and like pretending that they died. And the king is like, this is just not gonna stand. Like this is not good. So he had the young king and the servant hide in a little like hidden compartment in the wall so that they could overhear the conversation that was about to go down once the queen arrived, the queen daughter. Like it's weird that they're both king and queen. It's really strange. Shortly after having them hide in the cupboard, the great ship sails into the harbor and the queen and the captain get off and the queen is faking huge crocodile tears. She is crying about how heartbroken she is that he died in such a horrific, quick way, and that the captain was there for her and helped give all of the rights and like, you know, do all the proper honoring of the body and that she couldn't have done it without the captain and the captain saved her life and all this stuff, yada, yada, yada. In the meantime, the old king totally knows that all of this is a lie. And probably it was pretty hard to sit there and like listen to it knowing that it was all fake. Like it was probably funny. Like he probably wanted to laugh, you know? Cause she's just like carrying on and on. Like her acting skills were literally on point, but he knows it's fake. Like he's, he knows the young king is hiding in the cupboard, you know? Like this is all, the story does not make any sense. Like he's right there. The old king is not impressed. He calls young king and faithful servant out. And when they step out of the cupboard, the queen falls to her knees and begs for forgiveness. Like she knows this is not going to end well. She knows her dad. She knows that her dad like, you know, believes in being fair and stuff. And she knows she did something bad and like, this is not good, you know? She begs for his mercy, but he tells her there is no mercy. This man was in love with you, was prepared to die for you, brought you back to life. And yet you still murdered him in his sleep. There is no forgiveness for this. He prepares a special ship for her and the captain and puts them on it with no food or water and the ship is riddled with holes and sends them out into the ocean for their fate. And that's the end of the story. So basically the fate that the king gives her as punishment is the same one that she herself promised to do, which was to be buried with her husband. She murdered her husband and threw him in the ocean and then her punishment was going to be drowning in the ocean as well, so. That's the end of the story. Like these stories are so weird because a lot of them are not necessarily happily ever after stories. Like there's, you know, this one I would say is a more like happy ending. Like it's not happy that people died at the end, but the person who was in the right had a happy ending and the person that was in the wrong did not. And that is a theme that you see in a lot of these stories, but some stories you don't see this. Like they're just truly like, random and like weird and everyone dies and it's just like who wrote these stories you know and this story's weird i mean i never have seen a snake with a leaf in its mouth but overall i thought the story was interesting and it's one that i think is less popular probably less of you have heard this story so i hope i entertained you a little bit today i hope you are enjoying this series let me know in a comment below your thoughts because yeah, I would just love to know if this is something you guys want to see regularly, if, you know, it should be like a special like every now and then type video or something more consistent. So yeah, leave me a comment, make sure you're subscribed, hit the bell notification, and I will see you guys with my next video. Goodbye.